All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we begin our study of the word this morning, let's bow our heads together and go before the throne of grace. Our Father, we thank you that we have this time on the earth to serve you, that we have a mission given to us to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, that we have a mission given to us to make disciples, to cultivate those who would be uh, dedicated learners and students of the Word of God to grow to spiritual maturity. And above all, we're thankful that we have a salvation that is free, a salvation that is complete and full, based not on who we are, but upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died in our place, he died for us, he paid our penalty, that we might have everlasting life. And now, Father, as we focus this morning upon the resurrection and its importance in our lives, we pray that we might be strengthened, encouraged in our faith, encouraged as we understand the gospel more clearly, more precisely, that you might use us as your witnesses. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning I'm going to sort of take off a little break from our study in Matthew. We've been studying Matthew for a while now on Sunday mornings. And last week as we were studying in Matthew chapter 11, our Lord makes us makes a prayer to the Lord where he talks about the fact that only the Father knows the Son and only the Son knows the Father. As we were looking at what that taught about the Trinity and about the deity of Christ, we came to this verse, John chapter 10, verse 15. We ended with this verse last week, which says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. This is a profound declaration of the deity of Christ. He is claiming that his knowledge of the Father is equal to the Father's knowledge of him. The assumption being that the Father, of course, his audience would understand, would be omniscient and would know all things. And Jesus says that his knowledge is of the Father is as exhaustive and as comprehensive as the Father's knowledge of him. Nothing could be more clear in terms of his claim to deity. But then he adds an additional thought to that, and he said, and I lay down my life for the sheep. A clear statement of Jesus' intent to give up his life, to die on behalf of or in substitute for the sheep, which brings to bear the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, what the Bible teaches about Christ, what took place on the cross when Christ died, that it was in our place. It was, theologians say, a penal substitutionary death. Substitution meaning he dies in our place. Penal means he paid a penalty for us. And of course, whenever we talk about the death of Christ, we don't want to stop there because Jesus didn't simply die on the cross on that uh, that day almost 2,000 years ago. He was buried and he rose from the dead. This is what the Apostle Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. There, as he's talking about the foundation of our belief, he is talking about the the elements that made up the payment for our sin. His ultimate argument in 1 Corinthians 15 is against those who were beginning to say there really wasn't a resurrection. And his point in 1 Corinthians 15 is to emphasize the historical basis 
for the resurrection, the scriptural basis for the resurrection, the implications of the resurrection for every believer, one of which is if the resurrection, if the physical bodily resurrection of Christ didn't occur, then we have no faith, we're still in our sins, that there is no salvation, and that we are the biggest fools of all. And then he goes on in that chapter to describe that that Christ is the first fruits in terms of resurrection, that in terms of his resurrection body, his mortality put on immortality, and in the same way, our mortality will put on immortality and must if we are going to spend eternity with God, leading up to his ultimate conclusion, the apex of his argument in 1 Corinthians 15, that we have, because of this, victory in Christ, victory over death. So when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he's giving us the components that make up the work of Christ on the cross for not only our salvation in terms of justification and regeneration, but also in terms of the foundation for our spiritual life. And so there he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, this would see indicate priority, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. So he's making three points here to focus our attention on understanding the gospel. And all three are necessary in order for salvation to have been accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. The first is that Christ died for our sins. The second is that he was buried. Now, a lot of people don't spend a lot of time talking about the burial, but he includes it here. It's not that the burial is important for our justification, but the burial is important for for there to be resurrection. And as we will see this morning, the resurrection is the foundation for all Christian life teaching in the New Testament. So that the death of Christ relates to what we call phase one salvation, justification by faith alone. Christ paid the penalty for sin. That work was completed before he died physically on the cross. And then the resurrection, you read the resurrection passages in the New Testament, they focus on the resurrection is the basis for our new life in Christ and the basis for the Christian life and our future eternal life in heaven. So these three things are emphasized. He died for our sins, he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So I'm going to look at each of these three elements this morning as we think about the significance of the resurrection. First of all, the Bible teaches both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that Christ died for our sins. In the Old Testament, it is the prediction that sins would have to be paid for, that the Messiah would come and he would die for the sins of the world, that the Messiah is the one who would pay the the, uh, penalty for sin. And this is pictured in the sacrifices. It's depicted in various events that occurred in the Old Testament. And it is specifically stated in a number of places, and the one that we will look at is in Isaiah chapter uh, 56. The significance of the substitutionary atonement of Christ is that sin had to be paid for. There was a penalty that was established by God in the Garden of Eden that when, if Adam sinned, and when Adam sinned, he would die immediately and that death would be spiritual it was not physical he didn't die physically immediately as we've studied many times it, adam lived to be over 900 years of age he died spiritually the instant he ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that plunged the human race and all creation under the condemnation of sin it was a legal penalty that was applied to all of creation at the instant that Adam sinned. 
Now, that plunged everyone under condemnation, so that legal penalty had to be paid. And this is the focal point of what happens at the cross. In the Old Testament, a word that is used to describe this is the word atonement. The word atonement. And that word is not really uh, used in the New Testament at all. It's just used in English translations of the Old Testament. And it was a word that was coined by English theologians translating the Old Testament into English. The Hebrew word is kafar, and for many years it was thought that, that the primary focus of kafar was to cover. And yet, Further study that we've had in the 20th century, studying cognate languages and further reflection upon how that word was usually translated into the Greek Septuagint, shows that the primary meaning had to do with cleansing, had to do with cleansing. And the atonement pictures that we see in the Old Testament were all pictures related to substitution. And in place where we see this idea of substitution most, most clearly in the Old Testament is in one of the great prophetic Uh, messianic passages of the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, and I've just selected uh, three different verses to emphasize this, Isaiah 53, 6, Isaiah 53, 10, and 11. They're a familiar verse, all we like sheep have gone astray, indicating that this applies to every single human being. All of us have gone astray. Uh, Just a few chapters later, Isaiah will say that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, indicating the universality of the corruption of sin, that all have sinned. As the New Testament says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's that picture of substitution, that Christ, the Messiah, was to receive the sin penalty for everyone. In Isaiah 53.10 we read, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Again, going to the Levitical offerings, the guilt offerings, where you once again you have the substitutionary idea present in the death of the animal on behalf of the one who is bringing the sacrifice. And in Isaiah 53:11 as a result of the anguish of his soul he will see it that is God the Father will see it the first he is the, his soul is Christ as a res, the, the suffering servant as a result of the anguish of his soul He, God the Father, will see it and be satisfied. That's what we refer to as the doctrine of propitiation. By his knowledge, that is by knowledge of the suffering servant, (coughs) by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Clear statement that the purpose of the death of the suffering servant, the in in Isaiah 53, is to provide justification for the many. As what? As he will bear their sins. That's that picture of substitution. Now, when we look at the Old Testament, it gives us this background with the imagery, especially from the Day of Atonement, but also from Passover, which was observed just two days ago, starting Friday evening at sundown, uh, had the 14th of Nisan, according to the Jewish calendar, which was the uh, night of Passover, where Jewish families gather together, eat of uh, a, a special meal, the Seder, in commemoration of of their deliverance from slavery in Egypt, which is, forms the background for the Lord's table. The Day of Atonement was one day a year on the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, which takes place usually in September, according to our, our calendar. And it was the one day a year when the high priest of Israel would enter into the Holy of Holies and place the blood of the sacrificed lamb on the mercy seat to symbolize and picture the future work of the Messiah. This was done every single year. That sacrifice represented two things. As the high priest would sacrifice that that lamb, then, then it was a picture of a penalty that had to be assessed, that instead of the worshiper dying, the animal died. It was a penalty that had to be paid for sin. 
And so it emphasizes uh, the idea of the payment of a penalty and the idea of substitution. The lamb, the Passover lamb, was a lamb that was to be taken on the 10th of Nisan, uh, four days before the observance of Passover, and that lamb was to be observed to make sure it was without spot or blemish, a picture of the fact that the Messiah would, who would pay the penalty for sin would himself be without spot or blemish, would be untainted by sin. And so we read in Exodus 12:3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. And this lamb was to be spotless. Uh, Exodus 12.5, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And then this is picked up in the New Testament by Peter. In 1 Peter 1.18 and 19, Knowing that you were not redeemed, and redemption has to do with the payment of a purchase price, that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That phrase, the blood of Christ, is always a reference to the death of Christ, that he died for us. Now, this same image is picked up by John the Baptist, when Jesus first came down to him at the River Jordan, and when he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So here we have this connection between Old Testament prophecy and pictures and the New Testament, connecting all of this to the work of the Messiah and what happened that day on the cross when Jesus Christ died. The blood of the lamb in the Old Testament was symbolic. It represented the death of the lamb, which in turn was symbolic, representing the future death of the Messiah, the lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world. The application of that blood over the Ark of the Covenant depicted the the application of that blood with reference to the justice and the righteousness of God so that his judicial demand of a sin, of a payment of a sin penalty was met and his righteousness and justice would be satisfied. This is why Paul can say in Colossians 2, 12 through 14 that, our, that the certificate of debt was wiped out when it was nailed to the cross, not when we believed, but when Christ died, it paid that initial penalty, that sin penalty, so that the issue now is not what sins we've committed. The issue is, have we trusted in Christ? The sin penalty issue has been taken away. We're still spiritually dead. We're born that way. And we're still without righteousness, so we have to trust in Christ in order to receive new life, to be made spiritually alive, and to receive the imputation of Christ's righteousness. But what Christ's death does on the cross is it pays the penalty for all sin. Now, the second aspect that we see in terms of uh, the payment of the sin penalty, the uh, act of atonement, is substitution. Substitution means that one person takes the place of another person. And in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is the God-man, that which he does has infinite value. Because the sin of Adam was not just against man, it was against the infinite requirements of an eternal, infinite God. That sin had infinite manifestations, and only one who could uh, have a, a sacrifice with infinite value could pay the penalty for sin. Thus, you, the God-man dies upon the cross. The humanity of Christ stands as our substitute. His deity gives that which he does infinite value. Two Greek prepositions indicate this great doctrine of substitution. The first is the preposition anti. We use it at the beginning of that well-known word, the Antichrist. And often people think of that in the Latin 
uh, in terms of the Latin preposition where anti means against, but the Greek preposition indicates substitution. It's a substitute Christ, a false Messiah when it comes to the Antichrist. A clear way in which we see this preposition used in just a secular sense is in Matthew 2.22, where we read that when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, that is the word uh, anti right there, in place of, uh, he was afraid to go there. This is referencing to a uh, reference to Joseph. They're down in Egypt, and he hears that... that uh, Archelaus has replaced uh, his fa- father Herod upon his death. And so we see that idea of substitution, one person replacing another. But it takes on spiritual significance in a number of passages, and here are two that are important. Matthew twenty twenty eight, Jesus says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's that word anti, in place of. There are many people who say Jesus died for our sins, but what they mean is Jesus died on account of our sins. It's not substitutionary. It's what's called the governmental or moral view of the atonement. There's a little difference between those two, but I'm not going to get into that this morning, but it's the idea that Jesus is just manifesting how someone should properly live and give his life in a way that um, he gives his life for what he believes in, or he gives his life in a way that that somehow pleases God, and so therefore God is going to save all mankind. Uh, It's not an idea of a payment for a sin penalty. So sometimes you have to be very careful when you assess statements that people make about their Christianity. You can look at someone, for example, who belongs to a very liberal denomination, and there are a number of very, very liberal denominations who don't believe in a substitutionary atonement as we do. They believe in a governmental view of the atonement. And so when they say, I believe Jesus died for my sins, they don't mean what you and I mean by that. Uh, You have... uh, Denominations such as the United Church of Christ. This was a church that our president was a member of. They hold to a governmental view of the atonement. So when he says, if he's consistent with his denominational beliefs, when he says, I believe Jesus died for my sins, he doesn't mean what you and I mean. That's not a statement that he's regenerate. That's a statement that he is, uh, he just believes in some sort of moral governmental thing that happened that day, but not a payment for sin. Because they really don't believe in sin like you and I believe in sin either. So this is important to understand these these kinds of distinctions. The second word that is important is a preposition who pair. This is one I've referenced many times. It too means in place of or substitution when it's used with a genitive noun. When it's used with a, an accusative noun, when it's used as an adverb, it has other nuances. But when it's used with a genitive case uh, following it, it has this idea of substitution. A very well-known passage is Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He died as a substitute for the ungodly. For one will hardly die as a substitute for a righteous man, though perhaps in the place of a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us. Again and again and again we find this uh, substitutionary idea. We hear it every time we celebrate the Lord's table. When Jesus says, This is my body which is given for you, He is talking about substitutionary atonement. In Romans 8.22, we read that God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Substitution in our place. He delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? And in 1 Corinthians 15.3, the passage we began with, for Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. That's his authority. His authority is not uh, some sort of philosophical understanding of atonement, but a biblical scriptural understanding of atonement. And then Peter states it this way in First Peter uh, 3.18, 
For Christ also died as a substitute for sins once for, substitute again, the just as a substitute for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So we see this emphasis that Paul talks about at the beginning of his statement in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, that Christ died for our sins, substitutionary atonement. So you can't get to Sunday morning without going through the events of the day when Christ is crucified on our behalf. So we have the crucifixion. The next thing that Paul says in in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, is that he was buried. He was buried. Now, a lot of times people don't talk about the burial. They just sort of go past that and think that, well, in order to have resurrection, you have to be buried first. So that's just sort of there as a way to lead to the third one. But the burial, looking at the burial of Christ, is also uh, quite important. Now, we won't come back to this picture, but I want you to notice that in this picture, there is a scarlet cord that is stretched across the rock that closing the tomb and it is sealed on both ends with a wax seal now we'll come back to talk about that in just a minute but i want you to pay attention to that as you see the visual in in front of us this is described in all of the gospels but i wanted to just read this section from john 19:38 and following after this Joseph of Arimathea, that after this is after Christ had died on the cross, after the soldier had stuck his sword into his side, and the Gospel of John says that uh, blood and water came out. Now, medically, that's been attested as a fact that when someone dies this kind of a death, a death of crucifixion, as they're hanging over and as their bowels are pushed up against their diaphragm, that what happens after death is that the blood separates into serum and into red blood cells so that this would then collect on the diaphragm, the blood separated out into that which is clear and that which is red, so that when the uh, sword of the soldier penetrated the side of Jesus, it punctured the diaphragm, and it looked like, with non-scientific, non-modern terminology, as if blood and water came out, okay? So he he uses his spear, I think I said sword, he uses his spear to penetrate the side of Jesus, and blood and water comes out, evidence that he is already dead. This counters any idea that Jesus just passed out, he didn't fully die, he wasn't already dead, and they... uh, uh, He was dead. They took him down, and they began to wrap him in sort of a preliminary uh, wrapping of some spices, but they were preparing him, and so they needed to bury him. So Joseph comes. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's also a member of the Sanhedrin and a Pharisee. And for fear of the Jews, he came secretly uh, to Pilate and asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to uh, Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. So after all the ordeal of the of the flagellation, the whipping, where chunks of flesh would have been ripped out of uh, our Lord's body, and then he's hung on the cross with the nails that penetrated his wrist and his his ankles. And he's up there for uh, six or seven hours, and he's taken down. Then he's wrapped in a 100 pounds of spices and all of this. The idea that he's going to somehow come to consciousness and struggle and have the strength to struggle out of this is just, just patently absurd. So we're told they took his body down, bound it in strips of linen, with, with uh, spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. They had to get him in the grave before sundown, when uh, Passover would begin. Then we read, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, 
Now, a lot of people miss this. It's only stated in the Gospel of John. Those of you who've been in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's always a shock and surprise to people to go in there because you come in the door and you turn right, and just just about as far away as from me to the uh, door over here, you have the rock face of what would have been the... the uh, uh, Golgotha, the background for the, for the cross, and then if you turn to your left, uh, you walk about as far as from here to right across the parking lot to that other building, and that's where you have the uh, location of the tomb. It's just all right there. It's w- within a hundred feet of each other, and that that surprise. It all took place uh, very close together, and I believe that's a historically accurate location. And originally you had two chapels built there, and then eventually they were covered by one roof, and it became uh, one church. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, you can't visit the tomb today. You'll hear people talk about it. You can You can visit the approximate site of the tomb, but in the uh, 11th century, in the 11th century, the, the uh, Muslims who controlled Jerusalem uh, wanted to eradicate all evidence of Christianity, so they just basically chiseled down the uh, the hillside there where the tomb was. And so there's nothing left of it. That's one of the causes for the crusade. For the crusades, it wasn't because uh, Christians in Europe were imperialistic and just wanted to go beat up on Islam. It was that the Muslim... Uh, rulers were defacing and destroying Christian holy sites. That was just just one of the reasons. So, But all of this was right there together. There's a garden right there by the area of the location. There were tombs there. There's still some tombs there that you can see. And in the garden, a new tomb, that's important because it means no one else had ever been laid there. So when they discover it empty, it's empty. It's never been used before in which no one had been yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was, was nearby. Now, according to the Latin poet Horace, the Roman practice was just to leave the body of the criminal up on the, up on the cross until he rotted and fell down. But that was the Roman custom. Jews couldn't do that. They had a a very significant belief in the importance of burial of the body. They would even bury the bodies of their enemies after a battle because they believed the body needed to go into the ground. Since uh, the Shabbat, uh, or, or um, excuse me, since Passover was going to begin that night, they needed to get the body down and in the grave as quickly as possible. Now, there were only two options because Jesus was executed as a criminal, and he could not be buried according to Jewish customs with his fathers. I mean, with other Jews in a regular graveyard, there had to be a special graveyard where they would bury a criminal, and there would be one location that was set aside for those who were executed by sword or were strangled. And then there was another graveyard where those who had been stoned, hanged on a tree, or burned would be buried. And it's unusual that Jesus wasn't buried in either one of those. It was also extremely unusual for the situation for a criminal convicted of treason against Rome to have his body released to Uh, to someone who wasn't a family member. But Joseph of Arimathea wasn't just anyone. He was highly regarded. He was a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin, and he went to Pilate in secret so it wouldn't make an issue with the other members of the Sanhedrin, and he asked for Jesus' body, according to John 19, verse 38. And Pilate gave him permission to take that body. So Jesus isn't buried as he would have been under normal conditions with criminals. He's not buried in a criminal graveyard. Why do you think that happened? Because of prophecy. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. In Isaiah 53, 9, we read, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the... uh, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And so the burial took place at a special uh, gravesite that was owned by Joseph of Arimathea. Now, when they buried him, 
uh, the Sanhedrin came forward and said, wait a minute, we heard that this guy said he would be he would rise from the dead, so we better put a guard on the tomb so his disciples don't steal the body. And so they went to Pilate. Now, there is a lot of debate among scholars, uh, and it hasn't really been resolved whether or not he was get, given temple guards or Roman guards. And there's strong arguments on both sides. I tend to believe it was he was given a Roman guard that would have been four guards with a centurion in command. Falling asleep under Roman uh, Roman regulations would have been punishable by death, so they wouldn't have fallen asleep. Uh, they had strict discipline in the Roman army so that harsh p- penalties would have been applied. So falling asleep wasn't an option uh, for these guards. When they put Jesus in the tomb, they rolled a rock in front of the tomb. We don't know how heavy it was. It would have been extremely heavy, very difficult for for uh, many people to have, uh, uh, for a single person to have moved it. There's a gloss on a 4th century uh, New Testament manuscript that says that it was so heavy 20 men could not roll it away. We don't know if it was actually that heavy, but it was extremely heavy. The women, certainly, who were the first ones there, could not have rolled uh, rolled it away. And then it was sealed with a piece of cord that would have been stretched across the entryway and sealed with wax at both ends so that if that were disturbed, it would have been immediately obvious. Breaking the seal also would have been a violation of Roman law and a crime against the emperor. So it's very clear from the evidence that this wasn't something that involved a conspiracy. It wasn't something that uh, in, in, involved the disciples coming in and, and stealing the body. But on that Sunday morning, uh, something unique happened in history that a dead man, dead man had risen from the dead. Now, when we look at the scripture, this isn't something that just happened in private, but there were... Uh, hundreds of witnesses to the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ over the next 40 days and even beyond. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, that he was seen first by Kephas, that's Peter, then by the 12, actually they were still called the 12 in many places, even though there were only 11 of them at this point. Uh, Judas was dead. Uh, After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, Paul says. If you want to find out about it, you can still go to Judea and talk to people who saw the resurrected Jesus. Uh, Many remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, that is the Lord's brother, and then by all of the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Now, here's a quick list I'm going to run through. I'm not going to go through all all the scripture passages of those to whom Jesus appeared. He appeared to Mary Magdalene then to five other women. He then appeared to Peter or Kephas, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. Then he appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, who were uh, usually identified as Cleophas and Mary by tradition. Then he appeared to ten disciples in John 20, then to 11 of the disciples, including Thomas, a little later on in John 20. Then to seven of the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Then he appeared to 500 uh, believers there in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. He appears to his half-brother, James. Then he appeared to the 11 disciples again on a mountain near near Galilee. He appeared to... uh, a group of disciples and others at the ascension. He appeared to Stephen after the ascension. He appeared to the Apostle Paul on several occasions. And then lastly, he appeared to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. So you have a lot of witnesses, and and it's not mass hallucination. In any court of law, all you need is two witnesses. And here you have uh, well over 500, maybe closer to 1,000 witnesses who uh, who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Jesus Christ. And so the resurrection then is fully attested in the scriptures. And this is also seen in evidence that the disciples who were fearful and scattered at the time of the crucifixion regather together after the resurrection, and they have the courage that they did not have when Jesus was arrested. And all but one of them gave their life, according to tradition and some scripture, all but one of them gave their life 
for their belief that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was buried and rose on the third day according to the scripture. And so they were very clear about about that, and that gave them courage to go forward. Now, what are the results of the resurrection? Well, there are two results that are significant for the Christian way of life. First of all, we recognize that we have victory over death. Paul builds to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I just want to pick up uh, the last uh, five verses where Paul says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. What victory is that? It is a victory over death. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I believe the most significant aspect of the resurrection that is uh, emphasized in the uh, New Testament is in Romans 6, verses 2 through 6. In Romans 6, 2 through 6, this is stated many other places, but this is the central passage for it. Paul is shifting from understanding justification to understanding the spiritual life. And he begins with this rhetorical question that if we're if, if grace covers our sin, then let's just sin all, all all we can. And he says, "May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it?" It's a clear statement there that just because we're saved doesn't mean we should just continue to sin because it's paid for. That we are really not to sin, not to be saved. But because we're saved so that we will uh, perform good works by walking by the Spirit. So he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now this isn't talking about water baptism. This is talking about our identification with Christ's death on the cross at the instant of our salvation. Sometimes we refer to it as positional truth. It is also what is referred to biblically as the baptism by the Holy Spirit. At the instant we believe, we're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. So Paul goes on to say in verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, and here's the application, Christ was raised from the dead to new life, even so we also should walk. That's the mandate. That's the command. We are to walk in newness of life. Why? Because Christ conquered death on the cross, conquered death in the resurrection, and now we have new life in him, so we are to live as new creatures in Christ. He goes on to say this in verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, and we have, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And then we have a causal participle there in verse 6, because we know this, that our old man, that's everything we were before we were saved, was crucified with him for the purpose that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So the resurrection of Christ is glorious because it shows the approval of God the Father for the work of Christ on the cross as he is raised from the dead. But it is that resurrection from the dead that is the basis for our victory over death, over spiritual death, over physical death, and it is the basis for the new life that we've been given in Christ, that we can live free from the power of the sin nature in order to glorify him. So Resurrection Day is our Magna Carta. It is our declaration of freedom from the tyranny of the sin nature that we might live to the glory of God not in obedience, not as slaves to the sin nature, but as Paul goes on to say in Romans 6, as slaves to righteousness, 
that we might demonstrate the grace of God in our lives with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we're thankful that we have scripture to tell us, to inform us of all of these different aspects of the work of Christ upon the cross, his substitutionary death, the burial, which gives great confirmation to the fact that he was truly dead from the crucifixion, and then the resurrection, that he rose from the dead, victorious over death in the grave, providing us with victory over death, and providing us with the foundation for the new life in Jesus Christ, the life that no Old Testament saint ever had, the new life that every church-age believer is given at the instant of faith alone in Christ alone. Father, we recognize that there may be some who listen to this and are here that have never trusted in Christ for sa- as Savior. They are not sure of their salvation. They're not certain of their eternal destiny. And so we pray that at this time they would make that sure and certain. They would understand that Jesus died for each one of us, that there's no sin too great for your grace. There's no sin that is... Uh, too extreme. There is no sin that is not forgiven, but every sin was paid for by Christ on the cross so that the issue now is not what have we done. The issue is what have we believed? Have we trusted in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation? And Father, we pray that you would make that very clear to each and every one who needs to trust in Christ for salvation and that they might respond to your free offer of eternal life through faith in Christ and nothing else. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.